hidden beneath the waves for 70 years, concealed and forgotten, the quest for the last remaining wreck of its kind. I tried to focus on what it was exactly. Very slowly, I began to understand. One, two, three, four, five, and then I was sure, there it is. A daughter is given back the memories of her father. Seeing as we knew so little, I didn't really think too much about him. Hitler's megaplane, super weapon, or misconstruction. I still think of them again and again. Those poor lads. A tragedy on a sunny island, forgotten for so long. German-born Hertha Salzmann never found out about her father's true fate. She's been in the United States for 40 years now. This film tells her for the first time his complete story. When I see these pictures, then I can think of him, and yet I can't really remember him. Slowly, the memories flood back. In 1943, Arthur Busch was a soldier in Hitler's war. His daughter, Hertha, was only eight years old. One of the keepsakes she still has is her father's only letter to her. In 1943, he writes from Sardinia, My darling child, I was thrilled by your sweet letter. Write again soon, will you? Take good care of yourself so nothing bad happens. I wasn't really afraid that my father wouldn't come back. I couldn't grasp the fact. Just as he went to work, I was sure he would come back. This was not to be. In the summer of 1940, Hitler's Luftwaffe fly their daily attacks on England, the Blitz. The military commander plans the invasion of Britain. To deploy the landing forces over the channel, Hitler commissions a secret transport plane. The propaganda celebrates the dictator as an aircraft designer. Einen schweren Panzer durch die Luft zu befördern. So lautete die vom Führer gestellte Aufgabe die in kürzester Frist gelöst sein musste. Um den Tank herum wurde das Flugzeug entworfen. Ein Gigant der Luft. The development of the Gigant was an invitation to tender for the construction of a massive glider to land in England. The Messerschmitt proposal is simple and solid. 14 tons of loading capacity. This airship swallows quite a pile. Messerschmitt's Gigant is manufactured without engines, a super glider. The Gigant is derived from the construction of a transport glider. Transport gliders have to be lightweight. In other words, a metal tubing construction was covered with fabric, meaning it's extremely light. But when fully loaded, also rather immobile, the wings were severely instable and the plane was difficult to maneuver. It's an impressive aircraft from the outside. You couldn't tell it was just fabric. The name speaks volumes. The Gigant is the largest operational aircraft in World War II. To take off, it has to be towed by other aircraft, a one-way plane. Doors still need some attention. La Maddalena, an island northeast of Sardinia. An Italian holiday paradise far from the packed beaches. Anyone who has experienced this island's magical tranquility is bound to return.
Only few know of the grueling war that raged here 70 years ago. Let's try to imagine what the Europe of 1945 looked like. It was strewn with smashed war machinery, demolished houses, blasted landscapes, shot down planes. Kids played with weapons that were just lying around in the woods. That's all gone now. The broken machinery cleared and scrapped. Houses were rebuilt. Without the trained eye, today you practically can't see any scars of the war. For the Italian Federico Perani, La Maddalena has become something like a second home. He comes here every summer. The native Milanese is an expert on historical military literature. A French publication about the Gigant reveals a reference that fascinates him. In 1943, two of Hitler's megaplanes were apparently shot down here. The details are patchy. One Gigant supposedly crash-landed onto the island the other one into the sea. Is Perani able to reveal anything about the fate of these planes after almost 70 years? The first thing I did when I heard about the legend of these planes that crashed near La Maddalena was to contact the local papers. Then I talked to the island's inhabitants. Maybe there is someone still alive who could remember. It is the start of a passionate hunt for traces, above and below water. Pirani collects everything he can find about the Gigant. Only if he's able to reconstruct the tragedy is there a remote chance to solve the mystery. He has no idea about the dimensions of the project about to unfold. What motivates him? I think it's the relatives who don't know where their deceased are. It is still very painful for them. I wanted them to find out where and how their loved ones lost their lives such a long time ago. Nobody knows exactly where the Gigant crashed into the sea. The reports are contradictory. Pirani is adamant he can find the wreck. It was the distinct stories of both the planes that fascinated me. Both were equally important to me. Compared to the plane on land, there was absolutely no trace of the sunken aeroplane. At the same time, not a single person could report anything about the incident. There was nothing to go by. Yet my desire and hope to find something at the bottom of the sea was tremendous. Perani asks the diver, Cristina Frigieri, to search for remains of the Gigant. Through his research, she has initial clues to where the plane might have crashed down. To begin with, the team attempts to find the wreck with the help of an underwater camera. The search proves more difficult than expected. The area is huge, and there are only few points of reference. Then, Frigieri discovers unusual objects on the seabed. Could these be parts of the Gigant? Frigieri feels confident. The position is marked for a later dive. Antonio de Muro was born on La Maddalena. In 1943, he was five years old and lived with his grandfather on this hillside. Because of the war, most inhabitants had left the island. My grandfather and I lived alone here. It wasn't a good life. It was hard, very hard. You had to survive with what you could grow yourself or with anything else you could find. I would have eaten the rocks, goddammit. At night, we would creep through the gardens and take whatever we could find. To survive, we would gobble up anything. It didn't matter whether it was raw or cooked. 
costa cruda. On the morning of July the 26th, 1943, Antonio de Muro is out in the fields. What happens next changes his life forever. It was about 11.45 when we heard a loud bang. Saying that, my grandfather was sure it happened 15 minutes earlier. If we had been on the road, the plane would have crashed right into us. We weren't quite at the top of the hill, just a little bit further down. That's why we didn't see everything, but it was a huge bang, like an explosion. Antonio and his grandfather run to the crash site. The plane has caught fire through the impact. Those poor soldiers inside tried to find an opening to get out. It was such a dreadful sight, absolutely dreadful. One of these soldiers is Artur Busch. I was only five when it happened but I saw everything and can still see it quite clearly even now. I had to watch how those soldiers tried to escape out of the plane. The faces of those young soldiers are a sight I will never forget. Not one of them was older than 30. Another witness is the 15-year-old Antonio Cossu. My mother helped the soldiers as much as possible. She tried her best. She ripped up some bed sheets and attempted to cover their burns. After a while, some ambulances arrived and picked up some of the wounded. There were 13 in total. The wounded are brought to the military hospital of Maddalena. Their names are registered. Artur Busch is not on the list. Most of the soldiers didn't survive the crash. At first, I thought there were only about five or six dead. Towards the evening, I went back and went in again. I saw a whole heap of them. You could hardly tell the difference between them and burnt wood or something. There was a pile of bodies, all on top of each other. Hertha Salzmann's father is also amongst the dead. As a little girl, I really just didn't understand what was going on. I have no recollection of how terrible it was. I was just confused that everybody was crying. When everyone said that I would never see my father again, I didn't know what they were talking about. All that remains are memories and some photos. Aldo Ferrucci is one of Europe's most experienced divers. On more than 250 days a year, he descends into the deep. Wrecks are his passion. He's found countless wrecks and is going to help find the gigante. It's the very moment when a story ends. A wreck displays that exact moment, when everything suddenly stops existing for these people. That is what attracts me specifically, to be able to reconstruct the true story. It enables us to bring light onto something that nobody knows of or what might have been forgotten. Even for Ferrucci, this search is something special. Never before has the wreck of a gigante been found. The discovery would be a sensation. The search starts exactly where the first team found the promising objects, marked at the bottom of the sea. Diving in extreme depths requires specialized equipment and has to be planned meticulously. 
I have a lot of experience and don't dive on the off chance. I tackle a search more scientifically and with logic so I can make best use of the time spent underwater, and it leads to results. But that only works if the wreck is really there. If I add up all the dives I have been on and how many wrecks I have actually found, well, the ratio is about 1%. At a depth of 100 meters, divers have a time slot of approximately 20 minutes only. Nobody knows what the wreck might look like or whether it still even exists. Numerous dives, all without results. The summer of 1942, the Wehrmacht is gaining ground. To acquire so-called Lebensraum, living space, Hitler's war drives them further east. Moving supplies is a problem. The expansion of the front is immense. The Blitzkrieg has turned into a logistical war. The Germans were losing the logistical war because logistics never played a large role in the strategic German way of thinking. It never played a role in the German operative reasoning. The Germans set out to win a battle, to win an attack. Hitler demands immediate transport solutions. Supplies for troops are now to be airlifted as well. A powerful carrier is needed. The proposals for the Gigant are called upon once again. The Gigant is an improvisation, a typical German element. You somehow have a task, you have nought to offer, and therefore you just have to improvise. And so you improvise this required aircraft, as they say, out of the blue, which of course has some technical problems. The first colossal heavy load transporter in aerial warfare history is constructed out of virtually nothing. On that account, the large transport glider was equipped with six powerful engines. The radial engines, rated each at 1,300 horsepower, are taken from a French production. The plan works out. Even excessive equipment, heavy ordnance, can now be airlifted to almost anywhere. The Gigant, Messerschmitt 323, workhorse of the skies. It certainly closed a gap in demand. Today we have the Galaxy or the Antonov. They're capable of hauling bulky machinery, tanks and so on. The Gigant was able to do just that for the very first time, albeit in a primitive and not well-engineered form. The Gigant is classified as the forerunner to modern military transport aircraft. There's no mistaking the structural resemblance. Whether lorries or assault troops, a whole company of 120 men fitted in the hold. The field of application is vast, and yet, only 200 of the planes were built. One of the Gigant's last surviving crew members is Alphonse Ullmann. Hardly anyone has more knowledge of the ME-323 than him. The 19-year-old was one of the first to be trained for the top-secret prototype. The plane was a top-secret piece of machinery, and we were only a very small circle assigned. At that time, there were only about 30 people dealing with the subject. Ullmann is trained to be an aerial gunner. His new workplace. He is to avert enemy attacks with his machine gun. The actual crew members and people on the sites ended up making improvements themselves. They realized pretty quickly in Italy that something had to be done. They installed the first shooting stands on the top of the fuselage or at the front of the nose, but comparably quite high up to defend against other planes flying higher and so on, or coming in from great heights. Rare footage shows a crashed Gigant. 
American soldiers are inspecting the wreck. They want to find out all they can about the secret special transporter. The machine was kept top secret down in the south, so that not a single plane could fall into enemy hands. That was what mattered. If any one of them didn't get out, they were blown up or destroyed. Not one of these colossal flying machines survived the war. The Gigant becomes a legend. I would never go into the sea without a plan. That wouldn't be very clever. I'm always searching for additional information. The ocean is vast, and it would be like looking for a needle in the haystack. The more information gathered from people who experience the sea every day, like fishermen or divers, the better. Mario Vitiello is a fisherman from La Maddalena. Every day he sells his catch at the market. He knows everything about the sea surrounding the island. For decades he's been casting his nets here. One day he made a very unusual catch, a tag inscribed in French. I pulled up my net and there was a tag caught in it. That was 25 years ago. As you can see, it is written in French. I've kept it at home ever since. The fisherman believes the tag is off a French aeroplane. He knows little more. When we came back from a dive, again with no luck, Vitiello, the fisherman, led us to the place where he suspected another wreck lay. It was here that he had found this French tag. This was nowhere near our area. It was a totally different place. Ferrucci is of the same opinion as the fisherman. The tag can't be from the gigant. He's absolutely desperate to finally discover something more. And he strikes it lucky. When I reached that piece of metal to the left of me, it looked like an electricity supply pole. Something huge lies at a depth of 65 meters. I followed the pole until I spotted the first engine, and only then it dawned on me that we had found an aeroplane. Ferrucci can hardly believe how big this wreck is. My hopes rose when the fourth engine was visible. With the fifth engine, I thought, OK, even if I don't find the sixth one, it doesn't matter. But then it appeared. It was submerged in sand. I had absolutely no doubt. There never was an aeroplane of this size and with six engines. I realized we had found the Gigant. To date, this is the only discovery of a gigant wreck. For 70 years, it has lain on the seabed. As soon as we left the wreck to return to the surface, the active phase was over and the adrenaline level sank. It was only then that we realized we had actually found what we had been looking for for over such a lengthy span of time. To be perfectly honest, after all the days of searching in vain, I had stopped believing. I thought that it might just be a modern day legend. Autumn 1942, Rommel, Hitler's favored general, is fighting in Africa. 
he depends on the aerial supply line. The Mediterranean shipping lanes are under Allied control. A large part of supplies for Rommel's Africa Corps is airlifted in with the Gigant. Without it, the desert war would be impossible. Five U-52s would be needed to equal the hauling capacity of the Gigant. Another difference was that it could fly heavy, bulky cargo, artillery cannons, armoured patrol vehicles over the Straits of Sicily. The U-52 was unable to do that. To the occupying German troops, it seems that the Allies are observing the giant plane from a distance, without attacking. Everyone knew that the first flights towards Crete were monitored from a distance. They just left the field as they were unsure what exactly was going on there. These planes have one major flaw, their flight characteristics. It was extremely difficult to maneuver. It was very slow and it was easy to shoot down. If you had to fly a sharp turn, it was impossible. You were better off with a bomber. This was clearly visible when approaching for landing. You had to fly a long way around and descend flatly way before. A steep approach with the machine was totally impossible. Instead, it could land on almost any surface. Hitler's Wehrmacht is advancing towards the east. House-to-house -house combat in Stalingrad. In November 1942, the Soviet counteroffense ensues. The Germans are encircled. Hitler's orders. The pocket is to be held under all circumstances. Head of the Luftwaffe, Göring, promises an airlift with supplies to the troops. With the exception of the Gigant, everything and anything was sent to Stalingrad. We're talking about the NS elite shuttle aircraft, Fokker Wolf 200 planes, U-90, literally all transport planes. Even all the flying schools were emptied and their machines deployed as transporters. More just wasn't possible. 100 tons is the daily load of equipment and food supplies flown into the pocket. An insufficient amount by far. The situation of the soldiers becomes increasingly desperate. The conditions of the Russian winter, the frontline airfields of the Don Steppe, bad weather conditions, wind and snowstorms, to fly in there with a fabric-covered six-engined aircraft would have been utter nonsense. Towards the end, the German forces are totally exhausted. Most of the soldiers are not killed in combat. They die of malnutrition and hypothermia. On the 31st of January 1943, the 6th Army, led by Field Marshal Paulus, finally surrenders. Just under half of the 230,000 German soldiers survive and go into Russian captivity. Would the use of the Gigant have changed anything? The Gigant would have changed nothing in Stalingrad. The ultimate problem was serving an army from the air, in the Russian winter and from such a distance. That just wasn't possible. The Battle of Stalingrad is deemed the psychological turning point of the war. Federico Perani's quest has put the wheels of something quite magical in motion. Helping him along is a journalist, Giovanna Soro Saba. When I looked over the Italian and German documents, I realized that there hadn't been any proper communication with the families concerned. I felt it was my moral duty to conclude the research of the Messerschmitt aeroplane with a memorial service. Exactly 70 years to the day of the two gigant crashes, people gather together 
on La Maddalena to remember the dead. A service for the 63 German and four Italian victims. The ceremony has a very personal meaning for the bereaved, especially for Hertha Salzmann. Dass sich überhaupt jemand dafür interessiert, ist für mich the mere fact that someone has shown an interest is wonderful for me. First of all, I didn't think about it too much anymore, as I didn't have much left of my father, but the few pictures, well, I don't want to say he was completely forgotten, but as we knew so little, we didn't think too much about him anymore. Up here, on the hillside of Monjadino, above the town, is where the crash site lays. A cross is erected as a symbol to never forget. The images of the ceremony bring back memories. An emotional moment for Antonio de Muro. The plane was hit, and if it hadn't smashed against the wall, then everything would have been all right. It was because of the impact that the plane caught fire. It was here, against this wall, that is still standing. The last one who described it, he actually saw it. Karl Becker, Rudolf Bachmann, the names of the dead are read out. Peter Reut, Johann Berngruber, Arthur Busch, Sigmund Monk, My father was mentioned less and less, and I had no one to talk to about him. And now the memories are flooding back. I think this is very important, the memory of him and the others, of everyone who died here. Sixty-seven families destroyed by the tragedy of Madalena. My mother never married again. And I think she must have missed him terribly. On Madalena, the gigants caused some headlines. They're a part of the island's history. One has to consider the situation on Madalena in 1943. Most of the inhabitants were evacuated. The island was practically deserted and isolated. And those few who were still here mainly worked for the military. One piece of the gigant has been preserved until today. Only its shape has changed. Gina Poggi's pan reminds her of her husband and of the gigant. Well, during the war, we had to make do without so many things. When the plane crashed, my husband, he got himself a piece of it. And he said, I'm going to take this piece of aluminium, and if I can, I'll make a saucepan out of it. Gina Poggi's fiancé worked at the ammunition depot on the island. He intends to capture Gina's heart. So when he brought me the pot, he said, Gina, I've got a present for you. And I asked him, 
Oh, is there something to celebrate today? He said, no, it's a day just like any other. But have this. Now you finally got a pot for your sauces. The Maritime Museum of Madalena features many findings of the island's history. Gina Poggi Saucepan will find its final resting place here, even if the owner is slightly reluctant about the separation. A most unique exhibit. The war theatre of 1942, North Africa. Rommel's troops are forced into a retreat back to Tunisia. The commander-in-chief says no retreat. Hitler wanted to keep Tunisia unconditionally, under all circumstances, at all costs. Tunisia had to be kept. After the Allies' landings, the situation becomes critical. The Africa Corps puts up a desperate fight. Eventually, they face encirclement. Hitler once again forbids a retreat. He could not be diverted. Tunisia had to be held. Everything brought in like a one-way street over the Straits of Sicily. A constant supply of troops on anything that was available. Continuously, the gigant planes fly in new troops and materials to North Africa back out, empty again. The Army Group Africa surrenders. 250,000 German and Italian soldiers are taken into captivity. If only the troops had been pulled out, then the Germans might have had a way to defend Sardinia or Sicily. It was just sacrifice, and there's no way around it. It was like being caught with your pants down. The 26th of July, 1943, the fateful day. The two gigant planes are ready for morning takeoff from Grosseto Airfield in the Italian region of Tuscany. Their destination is Olbia, Sardinia. Everyone knew that it wasn't much fun up there anymore. Every flight was pretty much a one-way ticket. The Gigant planes always stay close to land for safety reasons. Water is a real danger. The landing on water was totally impossible because water decelerates too rapidly. It's like a shock impact where, in most cases, the wings are lost or ripped off. At 11 o'clock, the two transporters land safely in Sardinia. At the same time in Tunisia, Royal Air Force fighter planes of the 144th Squadron are preparing. Eight British Bristol bow fighter planes take off and are heavily armed. Because of their reduced noise engines, they were often referred to as the Whispering Death. The British at some point developed tactics to attack ships, so they have these bow fighters. Some are equipped with torpedoes and some are their escort fighters. They always work together, like airborne search patrols, trying to locate German ships, attack them and attack German planes. The squadron is on its way due north, along the coast of Sardinia. If a bow fighter encountered a gigant, well, as a pilot, you really had to admit the fight was over. We'll land and call it quits. There was absolutely no chance of winning. With their heavy artillery, the bow fighters were far superior. In the meantime, the two gigant planes are loaded up for the return flight from Sardinia. 83 soldiers are to be dispatched to the Italian mainland. The passengers on board were predominantly wounded and being flown out. I don't know why my father was on this flight on that day. Of all the days, it had to be this one. Artur Busch was not wounded. 
the purser was due to fly to the mainland to collect pay. Time is of the essence. The gigant planes were to take off as quickly as possible. The clear disadvantage was the enormous size. You couldn't hide that plane anywhere. Regardless of what airfield we landed on, they were all terrified that because of our plane, they would surely be attacked next. When the gigant planes roll out to take off, air surveillance raises the alarm. Enemy aircraft approaching. A fighter plane takes off as escort. When the fighter had left the airstrip, the two gigant planes lift off as well. The passengers anticipate their winds of destiny are about to change. A few minutes after takeoff, the gigant planes are discovered. Four bow fighters take up the pursuit. The two gigant planes veer away and try to find shelter over the island. When the pursuers are in shooting range, they open fire. One gigant is shot down over the sea. At that speed, those who weren't buckled in didn't stand a chance. They were thrown around. It's just like sitting in a normal plane that collides with something. Water has that similar effect. The water breaks much more. If the machine can't stay buoyant, there's no chance. In the waters of the Mediterranean, it's very difficult. It's more likely that the pilots were hurled out first or managed to escape through the fuselage. But for the others, that was highly unlikely. They probably just went down with all the rest. <laughs> Only few managed to escape the wreck. Some were saved. There were 10 of them. They were picked up by a military tugboat and taken to the hospital. After that, I'm not sure what happened. They were probably here in La Maddalena. The second gigant is also shot down. It crashes into the island. The fighter follows the attackers and shoots one down. Then the fight is over. Is it possible to find out anything about the crash into the sea 70 years after the tragedy? Aldo Ferrucci is quite sure. The plane did land on the surface of the sea. If the pilot would not have managed to land on the sea, then the wings or the propellers would have been smashed. But they are all practically undamaged. The whole wreck outside Madalena is in an unusually good condition. If the gigant had lain in a tidal area, there would be nothing left. Everything would be gone. Here, too, there will be a current. You can see that by the underwater growth. If there was no current, then the plane wouldn't be covered with all those corals. However, this tidal current is not very strong. Such a fragile construction would have been destroyed over 70 years. Comincio a riconoscere i dettagli, le parti, le if you get close and see all those details, the smallest parts, or even some special objects, like a book or a piece of clothing, a gun, anything, the power of your imagination is activated. Immediately you imagine how the wreck sunk, what actually happened here. And of course, you think of the sheer desperation of the people in there and of how they died. Aldo Ferrucci is fascinated by the wreck and its history. A silent witness 
to a human tragedy. These images are also very special to Hertha Salzmann. It was, of course, a saddening moment. But on the other hand, it was also quite fabulous to see where my father spent the last hours of his surviving life. And for me, this truly is a wonderful thing. A conference is being held in the town hall of La Maddalena. The two gigant planes have become a part of the island's heritage. A heritage that needs further reflection. For the mayor, it's an obligation to deal with history. In that period, I've been thinking about what the situation was like back then. Because if you look back, you can understand your own identity much, much better. This is the first year of our commemoration, and I'm sure it will continue into the future. The people of La Maddalena feel strongly connected to the wreck and its crash victims. Of course, the wreck of a plane or a ship will always be fascinating. One has to consider whether or not the site should only be accessible with guided visits. I think this plane has a significant meaning and that it should be protected. On this anniversary, the victims of the sea crash are also commemorated. Four kilometers from the coast, exactly where the plane crashed, a wreath is placed on the water. So much time has passed, and all the memories are coming back only now. And only now I can start to understand. When I was eight years old, I didn't understand. This is a real tribute. Although I don't really know these people, I'm so grateful to them and sincerely hope that one day I'll get to visit. Federico Perrani hasn't just found a missing aircraft. He has handed back memories to these people. L'aeroplano che si trova sul fondo io sento assolutamente un'importanza in quanto sacrario, in quanto I really believe that the aeroplane lying on the seabed is a sacred site and a war grave. It should be protected and left in peace. I hear rumors that the wreck might be lifted. That would be very sad. To me, the peace of those dead humans is far more important than that flying machine. Seventy years after the tragedy, what remains is the memory of the people. 
the gigant plains of La Maddalena, symbol and monument to a cruel war. <laughs> 